Bishop Barron, thanks for joining us on the Order of Man podcast. You are quite welcome. I'm delighted to be with you. Yeah, I am too. Uh, this is frankly a conversation in the past five years that I have not broached on the podcast for uh, uh, deliberate reasons. But I'm I've always been impressed with your level headed approach and your uh, you seem like a reasonable man. And, and I think this is a great time to have this conversation and you're the perfect one to have it with. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I, I really want to talk about and center this conversation around the idea of biblical masculinity. Obviously, our show is catered towards and 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 talks with men about being men and how to be men. And I'd like to uh, explore where uh, your thought process is on where masculinity comes from and even look into the Bible as examples of biblical masculinity and how we as men can step into that as well, or at least consider it, I should say. Yeah, good. Uh, is there a, is there a place that you feel like we could start as far as how the Bible or God defines masculinity? Well, you know, the Bible tends to present things more concretely and less abstractly. So you're not going to find philosophical discussions. You're going to see narrative presentations. So the Bible, I think, lays out to us um, narrative accounts of great men and how these men, um, you know, achieve their masculinity in relation to God. So I begin with those, with the great narratives, maybe especially David, who in so many ways is kind of an archetypal figure in the Bible, but I think is a, a model of um, of masculinity in the biblical sense. So I do narrative more than sort of abstract philosophical accounts. I actually think that makes more sense, and I'm sure that more men resonate with it being a narrative because yeah. you know, that's how we bond anyways, through story, right? The Bible is a collection yeah. of stories that we can— uh, extract lessons from. Uh, yeah. I, I guess I'm curious as to uh, when it comes to these stories, like how do you determine what you should take as, as literal interpretation or figurative interpretation of some of the stories and lessons in, in the Bible? Yeah, there's no easy univocal answer to that question. It's a question that's been asked as long as the Bible's been around. I'm sure. And I think the first thing is to be attentive to genre. So the Bible is a collection of books of different genre and for different audiences written by different uh, authors for different purposes. And you know the Bible would contain everything from legend and saga and tall tale to history to epistolary literature like the letters of Paul, gospel, apocalypse, song. And they're all different in literary style and intention. So attending to that, I think, is key to you know the question of is it literal or is it figurative? depends. And sometimes within a given book, you'll go back and forth between uh, various genre. So I know that people always want, on both kind of the left and the right, they want a univocal answer. You know, it's all history, it's all mythology or whatever. Well, it's, it's really kind of an amalgam of all those things, which is why, as a Catholic, I would say you've got to read the Bible within the church, meaning within the great interpretive tradition of the church going back thousands of years enduring to the present day. And the church kind of teaches us how best to appropriate these um, these stories. But in a way, like for our purposes today, it probably wouldn't matter all that much. You know, so if you take the narrative of David, I mean, how much of the David story is, is what we call factual history? You know, I'd say there's a fair amount of it. And then is a lot of it elaboration, theological um, development? Yeah, sure. And that we can have that discussion, but probably for our purposes, just to look at the narratives themselves and see what they uh, communicate to us. Um, it, that's probably a better way to go. I, I think it makes sense. I, mean, I, I hate to discount it this way, but uh, some stories don't really matter whether or not they're literal or true or whatever yeah. it may be. And again, I'm not trying to discount any of it, but yeah. for the context of what we're discussing, the, the lesson can be extracted all the same. Right. And, and it's a good point you're making, though, because, see, the Bible, it matters very much in our tradition that there's an historical ground, that God really spoke to real human beings in history. Now, we have, of course, theological elaboration and all that sort of thing. You don't have journalistic reportage in the Bible, typically, or what we call today history in, in the contemporary sense of the term. Nevertheless, that God really addressed of people, Israel, in time and in their history, that matters. And so you can't go to the other extreme and just say, oh, well, it's all kind of mythic, you know, um, uh, imagination. It matters very much that the Bible is historical. But then we can't go to the, the opposite extreme and say, okay, therefore, it's all just straightforward journalistic reportage. It's an amalgam of all that. 
Yeah, I think there is a trend in society to uh, assume that in a lot of ways nothing matters or history doesn't matter and yep. uh, to take things very lightly and very yeah. casually when there are some things, whether we're talking about the Bible or any other facet of life, that there's some places where we ought to uh, exhibit some level of reverence and respect for that thing and the seriousness yeah. of what it is we're talking about. Yeah, quite right. Quite right. What uh, what characteristics or features uh, with with David do you feel stand out and is representative of, of uh, b- biblical masculinity? Oh, there's gosh, there's so much. Uh, you know, first of all, David is one of the only characters in the Bible for whom we have a whole arc. You know what I'm saying? There, we have an account of David as a very young kid. Mm-hmm. And then we follow the arc of his life all the way till he's a very old man. And that's extremely rare in the Bible. You'd have that sort of narrative completion. But look at, at gosh, many points along that narrative arc we could, we could focus on. Look how he emerges. We first hear about David as a shepherd who's willing even to take on the attack of a, of a bear, of a wild animal, to protect his flock. So even as a little kid, David is humble. So, you know, when um, uh, the prophet Samuel comes to anoint one of the sons of Jesse, and they bring all these seven impressive sons before the prophet, and he goes, no, this is not the one. This is not the one. And then, do you have any other sons? And he said, well, there's little, you know, David out. He's tending the sheep. You couldn't possibly mean him. And, of course, that's the one whom God wants. First lesson there is, uh, is humility. When David is humble before the Lord, the Lord can accomplish enormous things through him. Watch now as his career unfolds. At key moments, the, the properly functioning David listens to the Lord, abides by his word, waits for his command, asks, Lord, what should I do? Well, that's the humility that began as, as the little kid tending the sheep and endures throughout his life. Now, turn it around. When does David go bad? And it's, it's, it's perfectly consistent in that story. He goes bad whenever he stops listening to the Lord. And when he mm-hmm. says, it's my idea, it's my plan, it's I'm going to do what I want. Best example is um, the famous incident with Bathsheba. Um, David's up on the roof of his house, you know. That time of year, mind you, the Bible says, when kings go on campaign, and David was always on campaign. David mm. always was ready to engage the, the enemy. But this time, he's at home on the roof, and it says taking a long siesta. Well, there's David now who's um, refusing his his task and never once listens to the Lord. In fact, from that height, he assumes a kind of godlike perspective. Now he looks out over his city. He sees the object of his desire, Bathsheba. He makes these staccato barking commands and gets her to come. Uh, David is not listening to God. He's acting like God. And mm. that's when his identity kind of unravels. So that's the first thing I noticed about David, is that he's a humble man. But then also go back to that, that first scene. The first thing we learn about him as a little kid, he's a fighter. David engages this animal who's threatening the flock. He's a little kid of extraordinary courage and a willingness to defend what's good and what God mm-hmm. has given him to defend. Um, that too now we can trace all the way from that opening scene, all the way through the arc of his life. David, like all the great kings of Israel, is a warrior. And he's willing to defend the boundaries of what God gave him, but also to expand so as to bring God's kingdom to a wider and wider uh, audience. So that courageous willingness to engage, that's a major part of, I think, uh, masculinity in, uh, in the biblical vision. And again, look at the Bathsheba. When they're meant to go on campaign, that's when David is at home having a Mm -hmm. siesta. So the refusal to engage, the refusal to protect, um, that becomes a source of trouble. Yeah, that's really interesting. I I know we talk quite a bit about initiative and and recognizing problems and challenges and then having the willingness to address them. But also I see in David and other uh, figures in the Bible— 
not only a willingness, but also the capacity, the capability to protect, to do what is necessary as well. It can't just be a willingness. It has to be uh, uh, supported with the ability to defend or protect or go into battle or whatever it is that that, that figure is doing. Yeah, and here's another interesting connection. Uh, so David is one of the great prototypes of Christ, now from a Christian perspective. So we look back at the Old Testament and see anticipations of Jesus. Jesus is the new David, or he's the son of David in the New Testament. And Jesus is absolutely a fighter. Watch how he engages right those who are opposed to him. But the interesting thing is, Jesus does not battle with the weapons of the world. And this is a very important part of the trajectory of the whole Bible. We're not honoring in Jesus just, you know, one more earthly or worldly warrior among others. But his great battle is on the cross. Jesus mm. on the cross taking on the enemies of, of Israel, but not engaging them violently, but engaging them precisely through nonviolence and engaging them with the forgiving love and mercy of God which does, in a very serious way, outmaneuver the powers of the world. Um, here's an interesting connection, again, with David in mind. Michelangelo's famous sculpture, right, of, of the naked David, so going out mm -hmm. to meet Goliath, but completely undefended. That's the point. And he's, Goliath, remember, in the account in the Bible, Goliath, we hear about every bit of armament he has on. Right in, in great detail, his spear and his sword and his and his armament and his shield and his shield bearer. We he's like an image of worldly power. David meets him uh, armed with only the slingshot. Michelangelo uh, emphasized that with the the nakedness of David. But see, the Christian looking at that also sees the anticipation of Jesus, who naked on the cross, defenseless on the cross, engages the powers of the world in the most effective way. And so it's a very interesting thing about, yes, uh, a warrior, yes, someone willing to defend, but if we look at the whole trajectory of the Bible, it's not in the worldly way, but in this far um, stranger and more efficacious way of engaging through, uh, through nonviolence. So anyway, that's, that's, if you want to get the whole picture of that trajectory, I would, I would do that from David all the way to Jesus. Yeah. It, you know, does that uh, nakedness of David, do you think that's representative of uh, even a level of, of innocence? I mean, we've been taught yeah. and, and instructed to be yeah. childlike in a lot of ways, right? To yes. put away a lot of childish behavior, but childish innocence in a lot of ways as well. No, that's precisely right. Um, because, look, David is an anticipation of Jesus, but also go back before David. He's a kind of recapitulation of Adam. And there's a whole uh, mm. biblical development of that theme. But Adam, before the fall, is naked because of, yes. as you say correctly, his innocence. Um, watch that motif in, uh, in the New Testament when the disciples, after the uh, resurrection of Jesus, there they are in the boat. And it says that Peter is gymnos, that's the Greek term, which means naked. Uh, a, a gymnasium, right, is a place where you would, you would exercise and so on. Oh, so interesting, he, right? He's gymnos, he's nude. And then he throws on clothes, right, before he goes to see Jesus. And that's meant to call, call our minds all the way back to Adam, who mm. was naked in the presence of the Lord until he sinned, and then he had to cover himself in shame. So Peter, who knew that he had denied the Lord, now has to cover himself before he meets the Lord again. You know, So you're right, that theme of innocence is, is interesting. And Michelangelo gets that in the, in the nudity of, of David, but also the nakedness of Jesus on the cross is the act by which our innocence is restored. All that's there, I think. How do we manifest that innocence in a way and, and, and tap into that without obviously taking our clothes off because yeah, that would be right. highly inappropriate, right? So, right? so how do we then in our own lives manifest that innocence, but also the, the opposite side of that is to be like you said with Jesus Christ being a fighter, David being a fighter. So it, it seems like there's a dichotomy that would be hard to balance. Yeah, it's the innocence comes from obedience in the Bible. So uh, when Adam is obedient, and obedire just means to listen, right? When he listens to the voice of the Lord, then he walks in easy fellowship with God in the garden. When he refuses to listen and he becomes his own Lord, so that's the, the grasping of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what that means, is he makes himself the criterion of good and evil. 
When that happens, his innocence is lost. Shame occurs. He disintegrates on the inside, and then disintegration follows on the outside. Now read Genesis 3 through 12. You've got Cain and Abel. You've got the Noah's Ark. You've got the Tower of Babel. All these stories of the disintegration of the human community that follows from the primal disintegration of Adam, which comes from disobedience. Mm. That's the way the Bible, I think, unfolds it. Genesis 12 is the call of Abraham, right? There's the beginning of God's rescue operation, and it says, Abraham listened to the voice of the Lord. So there's the key. Do you listen to your own ego or to a higher voice? Now, go forward from Abraham all the way to David. What do you have? Same thing. When David listens, Lord, what should I do? Lord, tell me. Do I go out against the Philistines? Lord, where do I go? He flourishes. And the kingdom of Israel expands during that time. When David refuses to listen, he loses his innocence. He disintegrates. The kingdom disintegrates. That's, a, I mean, of permanent value, that spiritual insight, it seems to me. And that's, that's the key to our innocence is obedience to a higher voice. Now, if you want, that's a real man. A real man is someone who listens not to his own ego and prerogatives, but who stubbornly and steadily abides by the law of the Lord, keeping himself integral and his family around him integral and the society around his family integral. That's key to a biblical vision, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad we're talking about this because I've thought a lot about what I wanted to discuss with you. And, I've, and I listened to some podcasts and things like that. And, and one of the last ones that you did was, was talking about choosing to keep the commandments. Mm -hmm. and, and what's really interesting is I talk with a lot of guys who have a very difficult time. So I, let me give you a little bit of context here. Yeah. Uh, about a year and a half or so ago, uh, I wrote a book called Sovereignty. And in the book itself, I talk about a man's responsibility to be sovereign over himself, to take yeah. individual and personal responsibility. And it was funny because I was met with quite a few thoughts about the, what people see as a confliction between individual responsibility, sovereignty, whatever you may want to call it, and then being accountable to God's sovereignty. Now, I've never seen that. It's not hard for me to make that connection. Like I, I am accountable to God. That's my belief. And also I have a personal responsibility. But it seems to me that there's a lot of men who can't quite seem to make the connection live to and for God. And also I'm responsible for myself and my family and my direct re re uh, obligations. Yeah, but one follows right from the other. You know, that the key to everything in a biblical vision, it's for men and women too, but for, the key to everything is acknowledging the sovereignty of God. God is referred to in the Bible as the Lord. It's very important, isn't it? Uh, the lordliness of God. God is king. God is the Lord of my life. In a Christian perspective, when I speak of the lordship of Jesus, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, that means he commands every aspect of my life. Uh, he's not um, someone that I entertain from time to time. You know, I find kind of mildly interesting. Um, oh, sure, a lot of spiritual teachers, and Jesus is one of them. And No, no, no. If you say he's the Lord of your life, that means he commands your mind, he commands your will, he commands your body, he commands your sexuality, he commands your family, he commands everything. He's the Lord of you. But see, from that lordship, so let's say a man acknowledging that, that gives him, uh, the proper sovereignty, if you want, over himself and over his family. That's where it comes from. If a man is having sovereignty over his family based on his own ego, God help his family. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a, that's a, a parody of what the Bible is talking about. But rather a man who, like David at his best, listens to the Lord, obedire, obeys the Lord, that gives him a proper sovereignty over his family. And then he'll govern his family well. And, and here's an interesting thing, family. We have a very kind of sentimentalized or, or secularized understanding of family values. Look at the Bible, though, about the family. What's the whole purpose of a family? It's to be a little society in which everybody learns his or her mission. Mm. What life's all about is accepting our mission from God. God's got a mission for everybody. What's the father's job in a family? The mother's, too, I'd say, the two of them acting together. Um, help their children discern their mission. 
when fathers and mothers begin saying, no, no, I'm, I, my children are means by which I'm going to accomplish certain ends, right? I'm going to live my life through my kids or I'm going to mm. manipulate, fall apart. Rather, the, the father under obedience to God, finding his mission, now is to help his children find their mission and finally to let them go. Um, examples abound actually in the Bible. Um, think of, of Jesus, the 12 year old Jesus in the temple. So he, he moves away from his mother and father. He goes to the temple. There he spends his time, you know, in the house of his father. When Mary and Joseph come and, you know, how could you have done this to us? Didn't you know I was to be in the house of my father? In mm. other words, his, his whole life was about the discovery of this great mission of his. It wasn't about, um, being part of some other other plan, some some other uh, set of desires, it was to be um, uh, in the house of his father, you know. So a good father helps his children discern their mission, and that's a father under the sovereignty of God. I, I think where a lot of men get hung up is they feel like they're not as in control, and I guess that's actually probably true, but they don't have as much power because they've subjected themselves to a higher power in this case. And and in their minds, they view that as an inferior position. Well, it is an inferior position. And, and uh, we shouldn't be clinging to false forms of power. In other words, if I'm claiming power over and against God, then I'm in the stance of, of Lucifer or Adam after the fall. Um, Authentic power comes precisely from a surrender to God. Now, here's the, here's the key. The God of the Bible is not the God of Greek and Roman mythology. That is to say, someone who's in, in competition with us, mm. who has a rivalry with us. So the more power God gets, the less I have. On the contrary, in the Bible, the, what God wants is for us to be fully alive. Therefore, the more I surrender to God, the more I become myself. God wants my flourishing more than I do. See, we sinners, part of the way to define sin is that we don't even know what we want anymore. We don't know what real flourishing is. God does. And so when I surrender to God, I, I find true power. I find true flourishing. And so if you see it as a rivalry, then you're, you're not seeing it right. And if you're clinging to, to false power, which is, say, over and against God, you got to give up that game. That's going to lead to disaster in you and around you. Um, no, no, no. Subjection to God is, is a manly thing to do. And now we're getting closer to the heart of the matter, maybe. The most manly thing you can do is subject yourself to God. And that will unleash what is best in you, in your mind, in your will, in your powers, and it'll be the best for your family. Um, worst thing you can do is cling to phony, worldly, power, which is, is egotistical and, and uh, opposed to God. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I see a lot of these men who, who have some of these thoughts, and to give a, a, maybe an analogy is, you know, these guys understand that waking up early, for example, and then spending an hour in the gym under voluntary hardship and being disciplined to do things that aren't always physically and mentally comfortable, that's challenging, as a as a way to unlock the best version of themselves physically and and mentally, yeah. I would say as well. And I know we're mutual friends with the Mind Pump Media guys, and and I've listened to your conversations with them, yeah. great guys, and they obviously talk a lot about this. So they see this level of discipline towards, for example, physical fitness as being yeah. subjecting themselves to to participating in these activities, and then it will produce a a, a better result but they can't seem to make that same correlation between subjecting themselves to the commandments or the word of God or the gospel or, or certain principles of the gospel. No, that's exactly right. And it's exactly the right comparison, it seems to me. Uh, along with the gym, how about a holy hour? Uh, go back to David. Is David a great warrior? Was David... Uh, undoubtedly in the kind of physical shape you need to be in to be a warrior. Was Michelangelo correct in the way he depicts David as this, you know? Sure, sure. But David is also someone who took the time, and read the scripture on this, to listen to the Lord. Uh, may that hour in the gym be met by another hour, I'll speak as a Catholic, uh, before the Blessed Sacrament, in the presence of Christ, asking for 
direction. I mean, I, I do that every day. I, I, I'm a morning guy, so I wake up early and I go to my chapel and I pray the, the prayers that I'm obliged to as a, as a priest. But at the heart of it for me typically is, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do today? Tell me, I'm, I'm, I have this, 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 and that on my schedule. What, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Um, that's a discipline, putting myself under a higher authority, subjecting myself to a, to a higher power. Good. That unleashes what's best in me. Unleashes, uh, just as you say, exactly right. That you're, When you enter into the discipline of, of the gym, it's meant to unleash what's best in you. It's not a subjugation. It's a, it's a liberation. Sure. So listening to God. What? Uh, so when you ask these types of questions, I've, I've always been very curious, and of course I have my own experience, but when you ask these types of questions like, what should I do? How, how can I help? Where, where should I go? What, what information do I need? And who do I need to visit with and, and talk with? How do those answers manifest themselves to you? Well, in a way, I always know the answer already. And it's because I've been... been uh, brought up in the church. And the answer is, what's the path of love? Love, which if you follow me, you know, uh, I often talk about is not a feeling or an emotion because emotions come and go. We can't really control them. Sure. Love is willing the good of the other. <clears throat> That's a nice, austere definition from my hero, St. Thomas Aquinas. To love is to will the good of the other. So Lord, what should I do? Well, what's the path of love that opens itself up for you today? How can you best will the good of the other today? Now, the specifics of that, uh, yeah, I find they tend to manifest themselves. That's to say God places in your path opportunities for love. And you say, ah, okay, that was, that was really good. I was able in that context to will the good of the other. The, the prayer I do at the end of the day often takes the form of what Ignatius of Loyola calls the consciousness examine. It's, a, it's an examination of, of, your, your, of yourself, really, in the course of the day. And it'll often take the form of, okay, what were the opportunities for love that you presented to me today, Lord, and how did I respond to them? And so I'm discerning both what was good about my day and where I sinned. Sin is a failure to love. That's always what it is in some form. Um, so that's how you do it. You, you always attend to that most fundamental question. What's the path of love? Then you begin looking around. Okay, what's presenting itself to me? Uh, God is a God of, of providence and of grace. That is to say, he's not a distant power, uninterested in us, but is deeply interested in us. That's the Bible. It's, every page of the Bible argues that. Um, and so he's interested in drawing us into his life. And that means into deeper love. So watch for the opportunities. I like that you're talking about looking for, acknowledging these opportunities, and then taking action, right? Stepping into them. One of the things I hear all the time is things like, well, if, if it was meant to be, or if it was God's will, it would just happen. And I'm like, maybe the opportunity would be available, but you still have to walk through that door. There's yeah. still some responsibility you have towards moving towards uh, loving others and serving him and serving those other people. Yeah, God doesn't want puppets. I mean, what a dull world that would be. We're just we're, we're automatons or robots doing, you know, we're just pre-programmed to do what God wants. God wants a, a kind of romance and an adventure, uh, which always involves freedom. So there's a proposition to my freedom. God has the respect for my freedom and lures it to be sure. You know, so freedom is not like sheer autonomy, like I just wildly decide whatever I want to do. I'm always being lured in different directions. My freedom is being engaged by this good or that good. And so God proposes to us all the time. And that's a way to read your life. You know what I'm saying? Is if you say, okay, I'm gonna start my day by just looking for what God is proposing to me. So right now I'm talking to you. And from a spiritual standpoint, it's like, okay, what's the opportunity here to will the good of the other? How come you know, through, I think it was through Jared Zimmer or Brandon Vaught or people that knew you better, that this opportunity came to me. And, um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And now I have this privilege of talking to you. And, uh, okay, what's the opportunity here for, for love? Lord, show me. And then I'm going to move on from this. I've got a kind of a, a busy day today. And um, all kinds of other opportunities will present themselves. 
So that's how you you survey your life. Not like as you know, as they say, just you know, one darn thing after another, but it's um, one opportunity for love after another. And how did I respond in freedom to those? Yeah, and I found with opportunities like that as well is that the the more often we step into those opportunities, the more that we are given, right? And the and yeah. the less that we step into those opportunities or reject those opportunities yes. in one form or the other, it's that 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 window seems to me to begin to close a little bit yeah. until you expand and you're willing to walk through more of those things. Quite right. And you know, there you're very much onto the uh, theological anthropology of John Paul II. So John Paul II said that every time you make a choice, a free choice, you're choosing to do a particular thing, but you're also, in the broader sense, choosing the person that you're becoming. Right? Mm. So right now I'm talking to you. That was a particular choice I made to be here in freedom. But I'm also um, choosing the kind of character that I'm becoming. And with each choice, that character is either strengthened or it's weakened, right? And so if you steadily walk the path of sin, you're always walking the path of resistance to God, of turning away from love, turning toward the ego. That's creating yourself in a very negative way. You're, you're producing a negative self. On the contrary, a saint is someone who continually chooses the path of love. And that creates the person they become. So that's a very important thing. And, and you can see in, in spiritual direction what you do with someone is ask a question like that. Uh, what kind of person are you becoming mm. by the choices you're making? Um, God wants you fully alive. There's a basic biblical principle. Gloria Dei Homo Vivens. The glory of God is a human being alive. Right? Mm. Um, all right. Are you becoming more alive or are you moving toward a death? Are you on the, the wide path that leads to destruction? Are you on the narrow path that leads to life, to put it in Jesus' terms? Um, okay, we better pay, start paying attention to that. Well, I just think there's a lot of people who believe that these in, uh, seemingly insignificant tasks or actions or behaviors or even thoughts uh, don't play a big part in the grand scheme of things. It seems to me that, and I've been this way too, I'm not pointing fingers, that, you know, this doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm, uh, don't show up fully or if I, you know, just steal a little bit or I tell this little white yeah. lie, like that doesn't matter. But you start building up this trend yeah. of behaving that way. And that's that's where it creates the problem. Absolutely. And that goes back to Aristotle. I mean, if you have a stick and you keep bending it this way a little bit, this way a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, before you know it, that stick is way out of out of line. You know? Sure. And yeah. so yeah, each each think of that. It's John Paul II. Each moral act is like building a, a wall or something. It's building an edifice. And with each negative act, I'm building this this dysfunctional edifice that I'm living in. Right. With each positive act, did I will the good of the other? Did I will the good of the other? That's the great question to keep asking. Yeah, I and like that Another question. way to put that biblically is, did I listen to God? See, that's the, now bringing back to David. Did I listen to God? Because God is love, as we hear. And so what God is always telling us is, be like me. Walk, walk the path that I give you to walk. Um, that's, in a way, all that matters. Yeah, that, that analogy, I heard another analogy with, with the tree that you're talking about. The bending of the tree is if you yeah. take a sapling and you let that sapling grow, you put stakes in, right? And you, yeah. and you, right. And you put the strings around the sapling and, and that lets it grow straight. And then once that tree, that trunk becomes hard and strong and stiff enough to withstand the wind and everything else that it's going to yeah. face, it's going to stay true. Right, but if yeah. you let it bend without having those, mm -hmm. those stakes in the ground, it's still going to become rigid. It just might become rigid towards something that isn't necessarily going to serve its at be best. The problem is uh, we so valorize freedom in our culture, and, and there's, that's a whole story we could tell. But we valorize freedom in the modern sense, which means self-determination. And again, nothing wrong with self-determination. I'm not against it. But when we hyper-valorize that, we get twisted because the Bible's not fundamentally interested in self-determination. The Bible's interested in listening to God. And, and I, my freedom is engaged. I'm not becoming a puppet. I mean, God's engaging my freedom. But I become truly free the more I subject myself to God, who wants my good more than I do. <laughs> See, that's the, that's the paradox. Mm -hmm. um, but we so valorize, like, I decide. Even if, as you, to use your example, even if 
I'm bending this tree in totally the wrong direction. Well, by God, I chose it. Well, so what? Right. And that, that Did you win much. because you chose it? Yeah. Right. So now I'm totally twisted out of shape, but by God, I chose it. Um, how much better to say, no, I want to put my choice within the greater context of God's choice for me, right? That I become the person God wants me to be. Now I'm really myself. That's the biblical vision. Yeah, makes sense. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, God's will and his desire and how do we express and show love. And when I hear that, immediately it comes to mind is service to other people. How do we serve other people? How do we draw them closer to him? Where does... Where does yourself individually, loving yourself, taking care of yourself, giving yourself time to work on you, and maybe even to a degree being a little selfish, fall into play here? Yeah, no, there's room for it, of course, because the old Latin uh, adage, nemo dot quad non habit, I mean, no one gives what he doesn't have. Mm. And so if life is all about self-gift, well, you got to have something to give. <laughs> I mean, if you're, you're so negligent of yourself that you, you finally have nothing to give— if someone is so physically debilitated that they, they can't possibly even do the acts of, of charity, well, what's the point? Or if you're so psychologically messed up that what you give is actually rotten fruit, well, that's no good. I mean, so uh, under that rubric, Nemo dot quad non habit, I would say, yeah, you've got to attend to your physical well-being and your psychological well-being. If you're going to be a, a, a capable vehicle of love, then you have to have some integrity, you know. So, no, I have no quarrel with that whatsoever. People... I, when I was rector of the seminary, I would tell the students, you know, keeping in shape physically is is not a luxury. It's a prerequisite for a priest because it's a tough life. It's a hard life being a priest. And, and you got to be fit enough to live it. Um, and then psychologically, well-adjusted. I mean, you got to do some really tough things as a priest. You're called upon to go into some really tough situations. If you're a mess psychologically, you can't help anybody. So right. no no there's there's plenty of room for that and that isn't that isn't selfishness in the in the biblical sense that's a kind of I'd say legitimate self care for the sake of love <laughs> you know yeah I guess that's a good point is is now you're you're speaking of motive right if if your yeah. if your desire to be in the gym let's say for example because we've used that already is to prop yourself up to yeah. get the accolades and the attention of others so that you can lift and elevate yourself and that's all that you're after I would say that that motive is inferior to I want to be in the best physical shape so that if my wife and I are driving down the road and we get in a car accident I can lift the car hood off of her. Yeah. Like that's Quite a different right. motive, probably in, uh, a superior motive, I would say. Yeah, and nothing wrong with, with being healthy and being fit and, sure. and being ready for life in the full sense. Sure, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as you say, it can tip over into vanity or tip over into you know, a certain self-absorption. But I, see, for, for the Bible, it's bringing everything in your life under the aegis of love. You know, that's, that's what it means to say Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Everything in my life is under the aegis of love, including my physical fitness and my psychological well-being. Do you think men are or, or, or have a difficult time with the expression of love or e- even just the word itself? Do you think that has become a problem for a lot of men? Yes. And it, it's a limitation of our English language, you know, because famously in Greek, you have three different words for, for love and one designates more like erotic love, another like uh, friendship, and then the third sure. one, agape, is what I'm talking about. And that's when you say God is love, that's the word you mean, um, which is the is the willing the good of the other. And so, yeah, the trouble in English, even th- the word love has an almost automatically sentimental sort of sure. overtone to it. And yeah, I think men can get kind of maybe squirmy around the use of that word. You know, classically, we use the word charity because caritas is the way Latin rendered agape. But the trouble is charity for us tends to mean like, oh, I give money to a charity. Give, right, right? tie their give, right, sure. Right, and so there really is, and that's a famous problem. C.S. Lewis addressed that in his book, The Four Loves. Um, there isn't a, a good English word that names exactly what we're talking about. Um, so stay with love, but desentimentalize it. Um, take it out of a purely emotional sort of context Put it in this austere, properly austere context of, of the will. It's an act of the will. And I think that appeals to men. Um, will the good of the other, even when that costs you. And, and listen to Jesus. Greater love, and the word there is agape, 
greater love hath no man than to give his life for his friends. See, and that's the test, isn't it? Because that's not erotic love. That's not even no. love of, of mere friendship. That's self-gift to the point of giving your whole life away. That's what we're talking about. Right. That's the heart of the matter. Yeah, and this makes sense. I mean, this is a this is a, a phrase that, you know, even some of the most hardened warriors use, right, in battle. Like, give your life, lay down your life for your fellow man, right? So I, I like that you're talking about context. And one of the things that really stands out in our conversation for me is that it's not just about a, a verse in the Bible or the passage. It's the context. It's where did that word originate? Like, yeah. what, what did that word actually used to mean or what was it originally? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's something that, that a lot of us, myself included, don't dive into as much as we could. And in a lot of ways, I think, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's laziness, maybe it's busyness, maybe it's just taking things at, at, at face value. But I think there's, there's a lot of, a lot to be said for diving deeper into the things that are important to you and really figuring out the history of these things. No, quite right. And uh, I'd say this about the Bible, it goes back to our original uh, question about interpretation. Uh, you, you never take a verse out of the Bible and say, oh, it proves my case. You can mm. prove anything from the Bible that way. Right, you can find whatever you want. You know, the famous uh, in the Psalm, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. Which you can pick out, there's no God from the Bible. <laughs> I'm right. an atheist. Uh, <laughs> you can prove whatever you want that way. It's better to attend to what I would call themes, patterns, and trajectories within the Bible. That'll mm -hmm. tell you not simply what's in the Bible, but what the Bible is really teaching. So for example, the trajectory from Adam to Abraham to Moses to David to Christ, that's an interesting trajectory to look at. The thematic connections between those figures, that's interesting to look at. Not like just picking out a, a verse here and there. Sure. Um, but the themes, but, you know, the trouble is, in our culture, there's so much biblical illiteracy now. People don't know the Bible the way they used to. Uh, read, I always find intriguing, read Abe Lincoln's speeches from the 19th century. He's assuming everyone knows the Bible. I mean, he's, mm. he's referring to it all the time. Sometimes explicitly, but often through an implicit reference, like a rhythm or a cadence or a, mm. or a phrase, that he knew, oh, everyone knows, that's from the Bible. Now, I mean, even some churchgoers often don't know the Bible that well. That's yeah. too bad. Well, yeah, it is too bad. I mean, it's it's too bad when you consider this is something I believe, and yet I don't fully understand everything about what it is I believe, yeah. right? I'm going to yeah. choose to follow this thing that I'm not fully aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge to me. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got a hard stop because you've got an extremely busy day. Um, yeah. Let me ask you a couple of different questions as we, sure. uh, as we cap things out here. The first one, what does it mean to be a man? I would say, especially in light of what we were talking about, to be a man is to be someone who listens to the voice of God. To be a man is someone who obeys the Lord who has put his own will and ego aside so as to abide by what God commands. And, and that's something pretty austere. That's something pretty demanding. Read all the spiritual masters on that. The, to the, the act and art of putting your own ego aside, to assume humility before the Lord is to be a man. What follows from that, and we'll now amplify it, is a willingness and capacity to protect what God has given you to protect. Whether it's your family, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your community, whether it's the church. Uh, like David, like Moses, like Abraham, you're called upon to protect. A, a man is a fighter. Now, I want to emphasize, you know, given the biblical trajectory, um, the importance of, of nonviolence. We're not talking about like just becoming like a worldly warrior in the ordinary sense. Though sometimes I think in dire circumstances, someone is called upon to engage in that kind of fighting. But, but a man is willing to fight to defend what's given to him. Moreover, a man is someone who, like David, goes on the march. He's not content simply to defend, but he wants to expand the borders of God's kingdom. I'll use New Testament language. Uh, that means the kingdom of, of love and compassion and, and obedience to the Lord. A man goes on the march. Um, David was the sweet singer of the house of Israel, the King James Bible says. Well, you know what that is? That's someone who can use speech in a very persuasive way, can articulate the 
the ideals and, and the goals of whether it's a family or a community or a society. I think a man is someone that does that. He's a sweet singer. He's able to speak forth the ideals of, of the family. Um, so maybe I, I'd use all those Davidic sort of qualities to characterize what a man is. But the fundamental one, someone that sets his ego aside and listens to God's voice. Yeah. Yeah, it's very powerful. I appreciate you sharing that. Well, what's the best way to uh, to connect with you? You've got the podcast and you've got your courses yeah. and everything else. So Yeah, wordonfire.org. Go on Word on Fire. Uh, and we have all the materials there. Um, I'd encourage people to join the Word on Fire Institute, which um, is now pretty strong and going very well. People who have um, made more of a, a life commitment to follow some of these basic spiritual teachings and to become themselves evangelizers. So I would say if you've gotten a little taste of you know, what we've taught, take the next step and enter into this community that is, there is going on the march if you want, see, is to evangelize, is to say, I'm going to go on the march and, and not just benefit from this for myself, but now I'm going to bring it out to others. So wordonfire.org uh, and then join the Word on Fire Institute. Those are two ways. Great. We'll sync it all up so the guys can, uh, can find that and they can learn Terrific. more. Yeah, I just want to tell you, I appreciate you. I, I, I've really respected you from a distance, and I'm honored to be able to have this conversation. And although we don't share exactly the same faith, I've learned so much from you and uh, inspired to you know, draw closer to God and my relationship with Him. So I want to, I want to tell you thank you for that. All right, and God bless you for that. I appreciate it very much. Yes, yes. And thank you for taking some time. I know you're a busy man, but I think that the guys are getting a lot of value from this. And, and again, wanted to thank you for doing it. Terrific. God bless you.